This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so now starting with the last part of pancreas, uh, probably the last part, and this part, four, and today we'll be talking about pancreatic cancer. Right, so the usual disclosures and acknowledgements. So coming to pancreatic cancer and the classification of pancreatic cancer, you look at the classification. Broadly, there are two types of pancreatic cancers. One is the exocranial part, and the second is the endocranial part. You all know the two parts of the, of the pancreas. So you can have the malignancy arising either from the exocranial, which is the non endocranial pancreatic cancer, which is the major uh, component of pancreatic cancer. Almost 93% of these uh, pancreatic cancers are the exocranial cancers. And only 7% are the endocranial or neuroendocranial tumors, they're known as NETs, uh, part of the pancreas. And uh, there are other synonyms for that, pancreatic NETs, you have endocranial tumors or islet cell tumors. Uh, we'll not be concentrating at this point of time on the neuroendocranial tumors of pancreas, we'll be concentrating on the exocranial tumors because they are by far the more common and what you usually encounter in clinical practice. So 93% are exocranial. Out of these 93%, 90% are almost adenocarcinomas, which is arising from the duct of the pancreas, that is the ductular epithelium. And that's why they are known as pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas or PDAC. The other uh, uh, varieties could be an acinar cell adenocarcinoma, you can have a squamous cell carcinoma, adenosquamous carcinoma, cystoadenocarcinoma, uh, this sister adenocarcinoma could be of serious and useless type. We'll talk about that in the later uh, slides. And then you can have the rarer types of uh, exocranial tumors. Now, coming to the exocranial pancreatic cancer, discussion of all cancer pancreas. Whenever we say can cancer pancreas, it automatically refers to exocranial pancreatic cancer, or more specifically, that arising from the duct. So, pancreatic duct adenocarcinoma. So, in all the discussions of pancreatic cancer, by far, 99% of the time, a patient, or when you are discussing a pancreatic cancer, you are probably discussing the cancer arising from the ductal epithelium or PDAC. That is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So, for our practical purposes, we will be talking about PDAC at this point of time. Now, if you look at the PDAC, 65 to 65 years is the usual age group. And more common in the males, slightly more common, 1.3 is to 1. And black males, in USA, it's the black males who predominate. If you look geographically, you'll find that the maximum incidence is in the western part of the world. That is USA, Western Europe, and then the southern part of the world, the southern hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand. And strangely, even the southern part of India, especially Kerala, has got one of the highest incidences of pancreatic cancer in the world. The lowest incidence rate is found in the African country, especially Middle Africa, and South Central Asia. If you look at the five-year survival rate, now this is an important figure, five-year survival rate after diagnosis. So overall it's six to eight percent. So not a very good cancer to have. If you have a choice, you probably not select uh, pancreatic cancer, but if you have a choice between a carcinoma, gallbladder, or pancreatic cancer, you probably be selecting a carcinoma of the pancreas. Why? Because carcinoma of the gallbladder, overall survival is somewhere in the region of three to five percent, much less than that. You should figure two to three percent. If you look at the locally advanced pancreatic cancer, you'll find that the average lifespan is only 6 to 10 months. And metastatic, the patient has got only 2 to 6 months to live. After that, the patient will succumb to his disease. At the time of diagnosis, well, for the first time, 50-20% of pancreatic cancers are surgically... 90 switch of the bike, please. Please go to the bike one. Kindly switch off the bike. So, at the time of diagnosis, when the patient is completed for the first time, similarly in gastric yes, cancer, when the patient is completed for the first time, and he has to be good to go somebody to. Has the, somebody has got the mic on. Kindly switch off the mic, please. At the time of diagnosis, 15-20% of pancreatic cancer is surgically resectable. Just like in carcinoma of the stomach, when the patient comes in the first time, 25% are only resectable, the rest three-fourths are not resectable. So, similarly, cancer, 15-20% surgery receptible, 23%, that basically means one-fourth, have already have local spread, local invasion, and half of them have disappeared. So, that basically means that 
eighty percent of them are beyond the stage of curable resection or curative resection. If you look at the risk factor for carcinoma of pancreas, the environmental factors and causes are important. The foremost among them is smoking, responsible for almost twenty percent of carcinoma of pancreas. And a smoker has got one to three times more risk of carcinoma of pancreas as compared to non-smoker. And it is directly proportional to the number of cigarettes that he is having. If he's having four, he is having forty. The one who is having forty will have much higher risk. And the funny part is that even if he stops smoking, he said, "Look, I have stopped smoking. I will not have a cancer pancreas." Now. No. Even after you stop smoking, even after cessation, the risk persists. Right. The second important reason why you can have cancer, cancer pancreas is the chronic pancreatitis, where the risk is almost five to fifteen times. As compared to a normal patient, obesity one to three times increased risk. The relationship of diabetes to asthma pancreas is slightly uh, debatable, and you will find that there is a higher incidence of asthma pancreas in patients who are diabetics, especially in those patients who have got a new onset diabetes, who is old age, with a low BMI, with a weight loss and negative family history for diabetes. So this. Is a special group of people, a groups of patients where there is a high incidence of carcinoma pancreas, and diagnosis of diabetes may precede the diagnosis of carcinoma pancreas by almost 30 months. Another reason why you can have carcinoma pancreas: cirrhosis of the liver, Helicobacter pylori infection, and then of course exposure to a number of chemicals in the dry cleaning and metal working industry. Genetic factors also play an important role. Albeit in only 10% of patients, and they either give rise to sporadic carcinoma pancreas or inherited carcinoma pancreas. Right now, that means a genetic alteration can be found even in sporadic carcinoma pancreas, not only in hereditary. In sporadic, with involved number of tumor suppressor and oncogenes, so the genetic pattern is such that you have involvement of a number of tumor suppressor genes. And it is always a natural progression from an intraepithelial neoplasia, intraepithelial neoplasia, to an invasive PDAC or pancreatic duct adenocarcinoma. The inherited variety, which runs in families, could either be non-syndromic or chronic syndrome. So I have an inherited cancer. Eighty percent are hereditary. Eighty percent of the hereditary, basically. Are syndromic, 20% are non-syndromic. In the non-syndromic, two first-degree relatives with pancreatic cancer increase my relative risk of of pancreatic cancer almost 18 to 57 times. That means first degree basically means that if my um, uh, father or if my uh, in the like my uh, uncle they have got malignancy, then I would be at a higher risk of Almost 80 to 57 times of having carcinoma of the pancreas. BRCA or BRCA2 mutation is also found in these non-syndromic varieties, which make up almost 20 percent of these in of the inherited or the hereditary variety. 80 percent of the hereditary variety are basically syndromic, and that is why they are much easily recognizable. Here also, see the risk is 50 to 70 times, and the number of syndromes associated along with the genes indicated in black. There is the Lynch syndrome, MLH1 gene, ataxia, Schwarzenegger syndrome, familial breast ovarian cancer syndrome, and so on and so forth. You have number of uh, syndromes, hereditary syndromic varieties, which can have a uh, incorporation of carcinoma of the pancreas. Right? Let's look at the pathology and pathogenesis. So we are talking about the PDAC, that is the pancreatic duct adenocarcinoma, which said makes up almost 90 percent of overall pancreatic cancer. The site is two third arise in the pancreatic head and the periaboral region. Out of these two third, one third of all pancreatic uh, head tumors are periaboral. So what we are saying is head plus periaboral overall two third. Okay. Now out of this two third, one third would be in the periaboral region and the rest would be in the head proper. Out of the total, one third arise in the body or tail of the pancreas. Macroscopically. It's usually a solid tumor. That's a more common variety. Hard, scalar, and there's a lot of desmoplastic reaction which gives it the hardness. And this desmoplastic reaction has got interspersed neoplastic tubular glands in it. 
So that is the HPE, the, the HPE vision that you can find in a pancreatic cancer. Now, the cystic variety is the second type of macroscopic variety. And there you have serous, seromucinous, or mucinous. So you've got two basic macroscopic types of pancreatic cancers. One is the solid type. The second is a cystic type. And a third, very less commonly, is a mixed type where you have a combination of cystic and solid. The cystic is basically because of necrosis of the malignancy. So it's not really a cystic. So you can have solid, cystic, and cystic plus solid. Microscopically, adenocarcinoma, we just said that. Pre-malignant lesion is the pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia. The sequential pathway to ultimate development of PDSA. The spread is local infiltration primarily along the nerve sheets, along the lymphatics, along the blood vessels, distant spread to the liver and peritoneal metastasis. So that is the pattern. So you have the local spread, you got the lymphatic spread, you got the vascular spread because of infiltration of the growth along the nerve sheets, lymphatics, and blood vessels. And of course, you can have a direct transcelomic. In the petrol metastasis, right? Now, on the other hand, the periapillary carcinoma, which is one third of all tumors of the head region, remember, the sites could be uh, ampullary. So it is also endocarcinoma. The sites could be ampullary. It could be terminal end of the CBD, terminal part of the pancreatic duct, and adjacent dural mucosa. So remember, there are four components of periapillary carcinoma. Don't forget that, please. Four components. Component number one, the distal part of the CBD. Component number two, the distal part of the pancreatic duct, right? Go more distally, the common, that is the ampulla, ampulla ovator. More distally, it is the area where the ampulla opens. That means the, the dundal mucosa surrounding the ampulla. So that makes up the four parts of the, uh, the periapillary carcinoma. And all of them are uh, adenocarcinomas. Here, terminal of CBD, it will be cholangiocarcinoma, which is adenocarcinoma again. Terminal part of the pancreatic duct, it is PDCA, again a endocarcinoma, adjacent duodenal mucosa adenoma, which is usually a part of the FAP, or familial adenomatal polyposis syndrome. Okay. Pathologically, apart from adenocarcinomas, you can rarely have a carcinoid and rarely a neuroendocrinal tumors in the periapillary region because remember, neuroendocrinal tumors are uh, more common. In the body and head of the pancreas rather than the periapillary region, but you can also have a neuroendocrinal tumor in the periapillary region, right? Now, the cystic tumor, so that was the solid part. The cystic tumors are basically part of what we know as the true cyst of the pancreas, as opposed or in contradiction to what we know as a pseudo pancreatic cyst, which is a by far the commonest cystic lesion of the pancreas. Now, if you're talking about true cyst of the pancreas, it usually includes. Uh, Neoplastic, that is a serous cystoadenomas. These are cystic tumors. Serous uh, cystoadenomas, more commonly females, multicystic, and it is usually benign. See, this is important. Serous cystoadenomas are usually benign. But mucinous, on the other hand, could be a MCN or mucinous cyst neoplasm. This could be, we'll talk about detail in the later part of the, of the lecture, usually in the premenopausal female. And you've got the second variety of mucinous known as intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm found predominantly in the old domain. The malignant transformation is high. We'll talk about that later. Now, coming to the PDAC, the clinical manifestation. How does it manifest? So, if it's in the periapillary and the head region, you can have obstructive jaundice. 75% is painless or you can have a painful jaundice. So, 75% of the time, a patient with a periapillary and that in the head would manifest with obstructive jaundice. 51% of these patients would be having a weight loss. Abdominal pain will be found in 39% of these patients. And you'll have uh, nausea, vomiting, pruritus, fever, GI bleed. The Courvoisier's law holds true in periapillary carcinoma. We all know that what the Courvoisier law says that if a patient is, has got obstructive jaundice, it is probably and an, a patient with obstructive jaundice. And if the gallbladder is palpable, it is probably not because of a stone. That's all. It doesn't say anything else. The rest are inferences. And it is wrong to call it a law anymore. It should be known as what is the Courvoisier's statement. So a better term is Courvoisier's statement. It is no longer a law. And feature of consumption could be found in a number of patients, right? But if the growth is situated in the body and tail, <clears throat> you have pain in the epigastrium and back. 
the typical back pain where the patient feels relieved on bending forwards. The patient can have a weight loss. Rarely new onset diabetes in elderly, which is a more common feature of body and tail rather than a feature of periamploid and head carcinoma. And usually these patients present late with metastasis. Why? Because it is not obstructing any of the major ductular system. That basically means the terminal part of the pancreatic duct or the terminal part of the CBD. So the manifestation and the clinical presentation is late in these patients, right? Let's look at the clinical features. Both of these, whether it is in the head or it is in the body or tail, both of these can also present with acute pancreatitis, duodenal obstruction in 15% patients, back pain, we already talked about that, hepatomegaly and mucosal of the gallbladder, we already talked about the Kubozio statement, and of course, secondaries, and the presentation of secondaries can either be in the liver, the most common site, it could be peritoneum, where you do a blummer shelf, you find the blummer shelf uh, in, in, uh, when you have the transcelomic into the pelvis, you can have a supraclavicular lymph endopathy. The workhouse lymph nodes are positive. And you can have a peri lymph node or peri subcutaneous nodules known as sister Mary Joseph nodule as a presentation of carcinoma. The clinical differential diagnosis is important. And if you talk about pure clinical difference, remember the word clinical differential diagnosis without imaging and biopsy. And at that point of time, that means you're examining the patient for the first time. At that time, you have to consider certain pancreatic pathologies like acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, because we just now told you that a few patients of carcinoma pancreas can present with as acute pancreatitis. Then you can talk about CBD pathologies, especially the periamplary variety of uh, pancreatic cancer, cholangitis, cholidocosis, cholangiocarcinoma, gallbladder, cholecystitis, gastric peptic ulcer disease, and gastric cancer. So all these make up a plethora of conditions which should be considered as differential diagnosis when you're talking about a clinical presentation of a pancreatic cancer, right? But once you start investigating, then you start narrowing down your possibility. So what are the investigations indicated? Number one, the hepatic function test or liver function test. And here you're doing a bilirubin studies and a coagulation profile. Especially for what? For prothrombin dependent clotting factor. Nutritional assessment is required, especially if you are contemplating a, a major pancreatic resection at a later point of time. So you should look at the pre-albumin level, at the albumin level, and transferrin level apart from the general blood picture, especially the hemoglobin level. The tumor markers which are important, the most important is CA99. It is specific of PDAC and sensitivity is 78%. 82% not very good, but still it is an acceptable sensitivity specificity. But the problem with this is why this low specificity and sensitivity? Because there's false elevation can occur if there's any kind of biliary obstruction, like for example, periamplary growth. It may even be normal in a uh, in a, uh, a number of patients with pancreatic cancer, almost 10 to 15 percent with PDCA would be having a normal CA99. And these are those patients who have got a negative Lewy antigen in the blood. Clinically, the relevance of CA99 is basically not more for diagnostic. It is some part diagnostic, but more important for post-operative surveillance and prognostication of a carcinoma of the pancreas. The diagnostic is not very specific and not very sensitive, only around 80%. The second tumor marker is CA or carcinoma embryonic antigen, which is non-specific and only prognosis non-specific because any patient having any malignancy spread to the liver would be showing a, a rise in the CA level. The imaging studies indicated apart from these biochemical would be ultrasound not indicated, see not indicated in caps except secondary biliary ductal dilatation. If you're suspecting periapoly carcinoma and ductal dilatation, go ahead and do ultrasound. It is shared with pancreatic head cancer, but it's not helpful in visualizing the pancreatic mass itself. So if you're trying to look for the mass with ultrasound, forget it. You'll not be able to see it. You'll only be seeing indirect evidence in the form of a CBD dilatation. But the gold standard is, of course, a multi-detector CT examination or contrast and CT examination. And the sensitivity is more than 85%. That's why it's not the gold standard. And how is it useful? It tells you everything, almost everything about the growth. It tells you the exact level of obstruction. It tells you the growth and its relationship with the vascular anatomy and local and distant 
the relationship with vascular anatomy is a very important part if you're planning any kind of surgical treatment and local and distant medicine is again important because that would help in planning the local uh, resection or if the patient got distant meds then that patient becomes incurable don't get ahead with the pancreatic resection very ampullary carcinoma best seen with the triple phase and that also in the venous phase the triple phase basically the non contrast arterial and venous phases of ct examination that's why it's known as a triple phase ct and then hyperattenuating lesions during the venous phase is the diagnosis of periapheric carcinoma then the ERCP again uh, important investigation but routine preoperability compression is questionable ERCP was initially touted to be a very good investigation and therapeutic application for well, the simple reason they said if the patient has got a periapheric carcinoma a cause of head of pancreas obstructive jaundice put an assessment let the jaundice come down and then go ahead and operate but that has now become questionable why because the moment you put in a stent there is a high incidence of bacterial failure so it is no longer a routine practice to believe it decompress before going ahead and doing a whipple's operation in a patient having obstructive jaundice so it can be taken as a therapeutic or palliative more of palliative measure especially when in end stage disease with jaundice you can't do anything just put in a stent that is the end stage in patients with new adjuvant chemotherapy planning new adjuvant chemotherapy in end stage again put in a stent give this patient chemotherapy by the time the tumor regresses the stent can be removed and in all these cases when you're trying to stent in a palliative scenario it should be a metal self expanding stent rather than a poly uh, polythene uh, stent or salacic stent right the other important is endos uh, endoscopic ultrasound right so routine abdominal ultrasound is not indicated endoscopic ultrasound is a very very useful uh, in uh, investigation for cause of pancreas it becomes a useful uh, guide for a uh, fine needle aspiration routinely ct is still to be preferred over eus but if you have a ct unidentifiable tumor <clears throat> or certain parts of the anatomy are not clear on a ct you go ahead and do a eus especially to get small tumor that the 2 cm size <coughs> where it is complementary to a ct scan mri mrcp for detailed luminal anatomy a very good investigation you want to see the pattern of the duct for cystic pancreatic lesions again a very useful investigation and it's also very good for metastatic hepatic disease sensitivity approaching 100% compare this with 80% of ct so mri scores on these count if you are looking at the luminal anatomy you are looking for cystic pancreatic lesion and you're looking for a metastatic hepatic disease fine needle aspiration biopsy can be taken not indicated in every patient it is required for unresectable patient before palliative treatment is required histological confirmation not essential if you're planning any kind of pancreatic resection suspecting pancreatic cancer right so if the imaging is almost sure that you have a pancreatic cancer please do not waste time in a a baps or a fine needle aspiration cytology but if at all you want to do a fine needle aspiration baps or cytology as you'd like to call it the routes are either go with a transgastric route that we put an endoscope and through the stomach pushing on the stomach you go ahead and puncture the growth pancreatic growth and take a baps from there you can go through the transduodenal where you go into the duct and take a biopsy on the duct or you can do a transperitoneal fine needle aspiration so these are the routes where you would like to do a fine needle aspiration but remember the the place value of fine needle aspiration is very clear cut it could be uh, not required in every patient unresectable patient for palliative treatment it is a must and then you can do a pet scan a pet ct is much better where you do a fdg scan not yet standardized but it does give a uh, indication of disseminated disease diagnostic laparoscopy as an investigation what is the status in pancreatic cancer it is a surgeon's choice advantages have been touted and these advantages basically relate to in those patients where you say it is a resectable disease on all imaging you do a laparoscopy out of these patients say if you have uh, done uh, 100 patients of cause of pancreas imaging and you find that Uh, in a particular group, say about 25 of them are resectable based on imaging. You do a diagnostic laparoscopy. Out of these 25, one third will turn out to be unresectable. So it is basically identifying unresectable in the imaging resectable group, right? Identifies early peritoneal meds. That's another advantage. Also indicates patients at high risk of occult metastasis. And how does it do that? 
by identifying large tumors in a CAA level of more than 100 units, uncertain CD findings, and body and tail tumors. See, so these are the patients where you would like to go in for a laparoscopic investigation or diagnostic laparoscope. So this is a special group of patients. You have a high CA, you have a certain CD finding, body to large more than three centimeters, I'll go and do a, a, a diagnostic laparoscope. So these are the advantages. And also in those patients where the clinical indicators of widespread disease, like for example, weight loss, malnutrition, visual impression, not very apparent, but, but with all these, you do not have a documented image of a pancreatic malignancy. This is another group where diagnostic laparoscopy would be indicated. Treatment of carcinoma pancreas, surgery is the mainstay of treatment. Remember that bottom line, malignancy, pancreas, resect. But as I said earlier, remember for the first time when the patients come to you, how many are resectable? Only 15 20% resectable. Right? And where is it indicated? Cystic tumors, amplitude tumors, neuronal tumors, and a group of patients of carcinoma pancreas, about 15 20%. So apart from these PDCAs, also indicate resistant ampullary neurodegrad. Unresectability based on the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. This is a very important guideline and it defines when you say a pancreatic cancer unresectable. So it depends on two factors. Number one, the degree of meds and number two, the vascular involvement, right? So two very, very important variables in deciding on the resectability or unresectability of a pancreatic cancer. So what about the meds? A metastatic disease, if it's in the liver, peritoneum, omentum, external lymph node, extra regional lymph node, it stands to reason, it's logical to say that this patient is not curably resectable. Agreed. What about the vascular involvement? So if we have a growth in the pancreatic head and uncinate process, lesion would be said to be unresectable if there is greater than 180 degrees involvement of the superior mesenteric artery or celiac axis, solid tumor contact with the first jejunal superior mesenteric artery branch and most proximal draining jejunal branch of superior mesenteric vein. See, it's both the proximal superior mesenteric artery, that the first jejunal artery, and the draining jejunal branch, the most proximal draining jejunal branch into the superior mesenteric vein. If they are involved, then this becomes a unresectable. So evidence of contact or even involvement makes it unresectable. Or if you have got a superior mesenteric vein or portal vein involvement that is not amenable for reconstruction. So one thing should be clear. Even if you have a portal vein involvement, there is a group of patients where you can go in and do a resection. Uh, you can do an excision on the portal um, segment which is involved and do a re-anastomosis. So it is not that if the portal vein is involved, all these patients become unresectable. No. What about pancreatic body and tail lesions? Unresectable if greater than 180 degrees involvement of superior mesenteric artery and or celiac axis, right? That is for body and tail. Aortic involvement, again, unresectable. Supermesentric vein or portal vein involvement, not amenable for reconstruction, again, uh, unresectability. So remember, unresectability, carcinoma pancreas or PDCA depends upon the NCCN guideline. Borderline pancreatic tumors are those tumors with short segment occlusion or supermesentric vein or superior mesenteric bottle vein confirm, which I just now told you. That why are they no borderline? Because there could be an instance where you can go in and do excision of that part of the pencil and do a reanastomosis, or you can put in a segment of graft in that particular area, right? Now, options. What are the surgical options? If you have a head and periambular carcinoma, you go in for excision of the head with distal pancreatico jejunal anastomosis plus local lymph and neck. Why do I say local? Because extended node dissection has shown no benefit, so it's never done. So in case of pancreatic uh, cancer, it is never a block dissection of the whole lymph lymphatic field. It's only the adjacent lymph node that require uh, removal along with the growth. That's all. Now, when you do an excision of head with distal pancreatic jejunal anastomosis, then you can have a pyloris preserving pancreatic odotectomy, or you can do a Whipple's pancreatic odotectomy where you can do a removal of the pancreatic head plus duodenum plus parolus plus distal part of the CVD. Only indicated when the uh, pylorus present pancreatic duodenum cannot be achieved. So either you've got a, a modified Whipple's or you can do a Whipple's pancreatic duodenum in either case. Total pancreatic mean, if you're doing total pancreatic mean, that we require in those patients where there are multiple foci of carcinoma pancreas, 
especially like for example the intra uh, ductal pancreatic cancers right intra ductal pancreatic cancer, we will talk about that later on and if you've got a friable or inflamed body tail so what are the message the message is that if you've got a pancreatic cancer it is not that every patient requires total pancreatectomy it is either partial pancreatectomy in the form of whipples or a modified whipples but in those cases when you've got multiple focus of pancreas or you've got a friable very friable inflamed body and tail where you would suspect that if you try to do a pancreatic jejunosmy you'll not be able to do justice to the anastomosis go ahead and do a total pancreatectomy so remember head and pancreatic ability usual partial pancreatectomy in the form of whipples or parallel preserving total indicated in a small group of patients and then you got the body and tail uh, pancreas you uh, should do a distal pancreatectomy with splenectomy in these patients now approaches could be standard that is the open approach or you can be having a laparoscopic or robotic approach and now people are preferring the laparoscopic robotic approach but still not the gold standard the gold standard is standard open approach now what about palliation now when you talk about palliation for carcinoma pancreas when you talk about palliation for carcinoma pancreas you're basically looking at taking a biopsy is mandatory because any kind of palliation you have to be sure that you have cancer so remember when i told you biopsy is not essential for planning out treatment but if you got a uh, end stage carcinoma pancreas then you have to take a biopsy it is mandatory before you go in for any kind of palliation right now that has to be a per operative uh, So palliation is a so 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 there are two conditions. One, you have opened the abdomen, and then you decide I can't do a curative section, and I have to go in for palliation. That means a paraoperative decision. Now at that point of time, relieve the obstructive jaundice. You want to relieve the obstructive jaundice. What do you do? You do a surgical doco enteric anastomosis. That means the common well duct anastomosis to a part of the intestine. Relieve a prophylactic. Gastrogenosmy because there are two things. One, there is a block at the duodenum. Number two, there is a block at the terminal part of the CPD. So in all these cases, either you can do a prophylactic uh, gastrogenosmy, or you can do uh, uh, if the, uh, there is obstruction, then you can go ahead and do a uh, gastrogenosmy to relieve the obstruction. But if the palliation, the decision to palliate is a preoperative decision. See, this is a paraoperative. If it is a preoperative decision, then you don't go ahead and do any kind of surgery. Just relieve the, the obstructive jaundice by ERCP stent, and you can do a duodenal obstruction. Do it by uh, gastrogenosmy. Third, you can do a. Uh, so the it is similarity so here what you're doing is in a pre operative you don't operate you can put in stents both for duodenal obstruction you can put in stent for obstructive jaundice and a guided biopsy as said is mandatory but if it is a per operative then you go ahead and do a surgical decompression here you do an endoscopic decompression that's the primary difference in the palliation if you want to relieve the pain then drugs can be taken per operative or guided celiac plexus block ct guided transthoracic splenectomy can be done if you want to treat the symptoms Stritoria, you give enzymes to this patient, you won't treat diabetes, treat the diabetes, right? The adjuvant therapy for palliation, apart from the surgical or endoscopic, you can have the chemotherapy, you can have chemo radiation, which is no longer used in Europe, but still used in USA. They don't do any more chemo radiation in Europe. Radiation has got a limited role. New adjuvant therapy is indicated in downstaging by uh, the growth and then going ahead and do a surgery. So downstaging chemo radiation ultimately is not shown too much benefit so that means we have to rely on chemotherapy and that chemotherapy is extremely toxic extremely toxic and old patients do not withstand now six months of uh, treatment is recommended five fu or gemcitabine are the drugs of choices 15 25 percent remission you can also go in for the polyphy renox regime or the other regimes you can read it up and the survival rate that is important 54.4 months and compared to 35 months in the gemcitabine monotherapy so you're looking at a good survival rate 54 months basically means what five six years you're talking about four 
the four, four and a half days, right? So we are looking at uh, increasing survival of four months, right? Now coming to the last part, and that is the cystic lesions of the pancreas. Just a short recounting. If you look at the cystic lesion of pancreas, we can have a true pancreatic cyst in 5 to 15 percent, pseudo pancreatic made up 18 to 90 percent, right? Other rarer, less than 1 percent, are lymphoepithelial, lymphangioma, dermoid, androgenous, and all these are so rare, less than 1 percent. If you find them, you treat it with mutilation or excision, no major concern. But the major concern in treating any pancreatic cystic lesion is that any cystic lesion pancreas should not be synonymous with the pseudocyst. It's not synonymous with pseudocyst, right? As is conveniently believed. 5 to 10 percent of all cystic pancreatic lesions are true cysts, including neoplastic cysts, 5 to 15 percent all neoplasms. All are frequently misdiagnosed as pseudocyst. That is the major problem. You find a cystic pancreas, you say it's a pseudocyst, treat it as pseudocyst, and you have a pancreatic cancer, and you have blown up the whole pancreatic cancer. So the truces has to be differentiated from the pseudocyst, that's one. And truces have to be differentiated from focal pancreatitis with associated pseudocyst and necrotic adenocarcinoma, right? So what is the approach to a cystic lesion? Number one, the first question, is it a pseudocyst? Number two, if not, that means the truces is neoplastic. If it is neoplastic, benign or malignant, right? The third question to be addressed is, whether you have a solitary cyst or a multiple cyst, because that changes the perspective. Because sol solitary cyst, congenital duplication, dermoid, pseudo, neoplasia, these are usually solitary. But if you have multiple, it could be part and parcel of polycystic disease of the kidney, liver, and pancreas, it could be hippel lindau syndrome and chronic pancreatitis. So these are the, the possibilities. So if you have pancreatic cystic lesions, you're looking at the same modalities for investigation, the same that we talked about in a pancreatic cancer including the arteriogram and tumor marker and FNAC. But this is a good um, uh, diagram which helps to differentiate the three types of malignancies. you got the serous and you've got the, the mucinous and you've got the intraductal, right? Intrapancreatic ductal, mucinous cyst adenoma, adenoma. And these are the differences that you, you can find. And if you look at the mucin, that is one of the important things. It has to be positive in both the mucinous type, this is the mucinous type, this mucinous type, this is the serous type. And the CA is again non-specific, but amylase would be found in pseudocyst, very high. It could also be high in the intraductal uh, mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma, right? Imaging, you'll find the location evenly distributed, but the mucinous type are more common in, in body and tail, and the intraductal more common in the head. So these are just uh, the, the, the comparison. But if you look at these figures, sign. You, Uniformly, you'll find gender, see, female, 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 female. So, as of, uh, by and large, most of these cystic tumors of the pancreas are usually more commonly seen in the female. Look at the serous cyst adenoma. I'll not be going into the details of that. But just a few figures of importance that 20 to 40 percent of all neoplastic pancreatic cysts are serous types. Evenly distributed, almost always benign is a very, very important factor and is usually a disease of the older age group, 65 years. Female, I already specified. And what is very, very specific about this is that it's a large size tumor, almost 7 centimeters. Well circumscribed cysts are seen. Histologically, what is very characteristic is honeycomb of small cysts, lining of locuboidal, calcified fibrotic cellate scar, which is very commonly seen on a CT scan, and that's why it's known as a sunburst appearance seen in 10 to 20 percent of these patients. Clinical symptoms, more than 4 centimeters. Two third patients are seen with more than four cells. That's why I said the average size is seven centimeters. Sign and symptoms of compression and vague abnormal pain could be found. Very rarely weight loss and jaundice because it's usually non malignant, right? Treatment because malignancy is non existent. Most of the time you'll be looking at conservative management, especially if the patient does not have any symptoms, patient is old age group, and the patient has got uh, disease in the head of the pancreas. But resection may be required if it is symptomatic, size more than four centimeters, and there has been rapid growth. Right? Mucinous, 20-40% of all cystic neoplasms. Again, see, female and fifth decade again. Right? Average size 6 and we again a large tumor. Most commonly body and tail as opposed to serous, which is more common in the head. Histologically, you have the tall columnar cells which are staining positive for CA and mucin. That is very important. That's why it's not a mucinous tumor. It will also stain for estrogen and progesterone and it will be having ovarian-like stroma surrounding these cells and because having uh, ovary like stroma is staining possible estrogen for strong, right? 
FNA fluid analysis will show in lucid, high CEA, more than 192 nanogram per ml, and low MILAs. Clinically presentation, most commonly incidental, non-specific abnormal pain in 50%, history of pancreatitis in 20%. So most of the time, these tumors are incidental findings. How do you diagnose them? A CECT is again diagnostic, solitary cysts with fine septation and thin rim of calcification. Cessio malignancy, was malignancy, axial calcification, and larger tumor size. Malignant potential is 10%. See, only 10%. That 90% are benign. So it is not that mucinous tumor is a malignant tumor. 90% are benign, 10% malignant. If it is less than 3 cm, unilocular, without a solid component, wait and watch. Don't go and do anything. But you have to be careful. Why do you need a surveillance? Because even with, with a benign tumor, they can have, excuse me, size of dysplasia, carcinoma C2, and more common if size is more than 3 cm. The treatment is pancreatic resection, but what is very important is that all should be resected and not enucleated, right? A variant of this mucinous cystadenoma is duct actatic. I don't think you need to go into them, but the most important is a pancreatogram will, giving, uh, will show a diagnostic grape-like cluster of pear-shaped dilatation site uh, of these side branches. And the treatment is pancreatic adrenectomy or distal pancreatic, right? Now, coming to the most important and the most common cystic tumor, the intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasia arising from the ducts or the side branches or both. Most common, I said, histologically, mucin secreting columnar cells with papillary projection, which are not found in, in the papillary projection of the duct, which are not found in the other variety of cystic tumor. The grades are four, low grade, moderate grade, high grade. But see the word, dysplasia. So these are non-malignant. But the fourth grade is the invasive malignancy, the malignant type of IPMN, right? The subtypes, these are the HPA grades. Subtypes are arising from the branch. So it will be known as the branch duct IPMN, BD IPMN, 10 to 15% are invasive. And 20% of the IPMN are arising from the branches. 80% arising from the main duct or a combination of main duct and side branch. In the side branch, 10 to 15% are invasive, that means malignant. 30 to 50% invasive, that means malignant. They can be multifocal, focal, or diffuse. Clinically, 50% with abnormal pain and 25% obstructive jaundice. What is important to IPMN is that you're looking for histological features which are worrisome features. Histological and macroscopic and imaging features. For example, a main duct dilated up to 9 millimeters. So these are some of the features which, if they are present, would be worrisome. And if you're finding high risk features, then they are those patients where you have to go in for a, a early surgical interference. ERCP is diagnostic. If you see fine mucin emerging from the papilla, it is sine qua non. It cannot be anything apart from IPMN. It's diagnostic. You put in an uh, endoscope and you find mucin trickling out through the ampulla, it is a IPMN, right? Willis tumor in the in the duct can be seen on ERCP, right? Then a uh, CT scan or endoscopic ultrasound is the cornerstone for diagnosis, should be treated as malignant in most of the cases because finding invasiveness is not very clear. So if you have those worrisome features, or you have high risk features, go ahead and consider it to be malignant and treat it as such. The management, remember not all patients with the branch duct IPMN requires surgery. Again, very important. It's not that if I have an IPMN every uh, I have to have surgery. More than 3 centimeters, surgical resection. Less than 2 centimeters, surveillance. But if I have a main duct IPMN, either I have to go in for R0, R1, partial pancreatomy or total pancreatomy. Again, the, the feature is that if you have got a pancreatic cancer, it's not that every patient should be going in for total pancreatomy. No, that's not required. Just like in PDCA, right? Uh, PDSC. So here also in uh, main duct IPMN, total pancreatectomy may be required or a partial pancreatectomy, which is R0 or R1. The survival rates are better than PDCA's. PDCA has got a survival rate. Remember, we showed you with METS, it was months, right? Local invasion months. Five-year survival rate is 5 to 6%. Here, the five-year survival rate is non-invasive, 77%. Invasive, it is 43%. Still much better than a PDCA, right? The solid pseudopapillary is a very, very rare tumor. And malignant but slow growth, again in females, but in younger age group, maximum in body and day. You'll find hemorrhage in these tumors, cystic degeneration, local invasion, and you have to go in for resection. 
So this is just a flow chart as to how you can tackle it with a with a EUS with CT. This is not uh, US EUS CT solitary multi system is basically managing the cystic tumor, right? I think that's all for today. We will be starting a new chapter next time. If you have any questions, you can always come back to me. Thank you for your time.